Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am seeing you once again with lecture 11 of modern drama that is novel 2. What we are going to do in today's talk, um, we are going to continue with our character analysis of the story and uh, we'll primarily talk about Lily Briscoe and we will try to find out uh, the relationship um, between Lily as a representative of um, female gender and what are her views regarding the opposite gender. Specifically, we'll explore her relationship with Charles Stensley and William Banks and this will give us two different views, point of views that she shares for um, men of two different ages. Um, First comes love, then comes marriage. This is Lily's philosophy. We will try to talk about this too. We will also look into James Ramsey's character and we will try to explore some themes uh, which will include uh, time, uh, transcendence of life and work, art as a means of preservation, the subjective nature of reality, the restorative effects of beauty, memory and the past, love, gender, marriage, manipulation, admiration, identity, victory, friendship, laws and order. Virginia Woolf's work is full of social themes and she in a way uh, add weightage and uh, strengthen her theme and thematical structures of her story by the um, beautiful use of motives and symbols and so in order to understand them uh, deeply, um, we will try to look into the differing behaviors of men and women as a motive and brackets, parentheses used all around in the uh, text of the story. We will also look at the symbols that she uses uh, and the most prominent symbol, the lighthouse itself, then Lily's painting, the Ramses house, the sea, the boar's skull, the fruit basket, so on and so forth. So. Um, for today's lecture, let's start with Lily's character in detail and let us see how well we could know her so far. Have you ever heard the term Mary Sue? It's an internet slang expression for a character in a story who seems like total wish fulfillment for the author. Someone the author either really identifies with or really wants to be with. All right, so um, basically Lily is a kind of character that we can call a, a um, favorite character of Virginia Woolf in the play. And many a times she uses this character to narrate what, narrate her own feelings. Um, a com common marker of the Mary Sue is that she's really pretty. If she's physically flawed at all, it's a flaw that makes her even more appealing like a single streak of silver hair in an otherwise flaming mane of beautiful red curls. Another sign that a character might be a um, self-insertion is that she's really good at everything, almost everything. You will not be able to find a, a big flaw in her character. She'll be the most caring, most talented character of the lot. So if you run across a character in a fantasy novel who's too beautiful to be real with almond-shaped violet eyes and a perfect um, vulpturous without being too curvy figure who turns out to be a half um, eleven daughter of um, uh, Gandalf and magic beyond imagining and wisdom beyond her age, chances are that's a Mary Sue. That's a character that the writer of the story would like to identify with. So, and in the best possible way, without all of these um, magic powers of the, of the fairy, Lily Briscoe is a kind of Virginia Woolf's Mary Sue. She's a person who most closely mirrors Woolf's own preoccupations with gender as well as art. And she's also intriguing uh, looking for an analysis of the significance of Lily's Chinese eyes. So consider the middle section of the book in which um, Wolf uses words to sketch the essence of 10 years of time's passage for the Ramses family by focusing on the slow decline of their house in the Isle of Skye. 
wolf works um, basically uh, in other words, indirectly and in a, in, a, in, a, in a wandering manner to depict the decay of the Ramsey family without ever actually coming out and showing how the family has interacted over those 10 years. And this is really similar to the painting strategy that Lily uses into the lighthouse. It was basically Mr. Ramsey reading to James Lily said she knew William Banks' objection that no one could tell it for a human shape. But she had made no attempt at likeness, she said. For what reason had she introduced them then, he asked. Why indeed? Except that if there in that corner it was bright hair, in this she felt the need of darkness. Simple, obvious, commonplace as it was. Mr. Banks was entrusted. Mother and child then, objects of universal veneration. And in this case, the mother was famous for her beauty. Might be reduced, he pondered, to a purple shadow without ir irreverence. These are the, this is the uh, text from your um, novel. Lily's painting of James and Mrs. Ramsay suggests Mrs. Ramsay's character with a few lines and a bit of purple shadowing. She had made no attempt at likeness. Lily attempts to capture something truthful in her portrait without being too picky about making the painting actually look like Mrs. Ramsay. That is the twist. And in painting, the essence of Mrs. Ramsay, rather than her physical form, she's not trying to get only Mrs. Ramsay. She's also trying to represent something ineffable or inexpressible about mother and child, object of universal veneration. By the way, veneration means admiration and respect. So please, if, if there is any word that you do not understand meaning of, try to get it from the dictionary and then try to get back to the text. Do not ignore alien words. Try to absorb them by first putting them into their connotative and then denotative meanings. Well, this uh, after knowing Lily's character and how, how closely it signifies and identifies with the character of the uh, writer, we probably need to understand how Virginia Woolf um, feels about the opposite gender being a, being a uh, highlighted feminist. Um, and for that matter, we will discuss Lily's character uh, in relationship with Charles Stansley as a representative of youth, a young energetic scholar, and William Banks, uh, who belongs to another uh, time of uh, life. Mrs. Ramsey can't stand for a woman of her acquaintance to stay unmarried. She's a total matchmaker and Lily isn't immune. The guy Mrs. Ramsey uh, thinks Lily should marry is William Banks, an old widower of Mr. Ramsey's acquaintance who becomes one of the greatest friends of Lily Briscoe's life. What's really interesting about Lily's relationship with Mr. Banks is the way that it mo models a totally non-sexual um, um, kind and mutually supportive relationship between a man and a woman, totally plat platonic. Something that as a woman artist in the 1920s, Lily seems cynical about. So the relationship stands in contrast to Mrs. Ramsey's incredibly um, domineering, oppressive influence on Lily's painting. For more on this relationship, we can also talk about um, when we are discussing the critical questions in the end. Mrs. Mr. Ramsey makes it impossible for Lily to paint as she chooses. Let Mr. Ramsey be 50 feet away. Let him not even speak to you. Let him not even see you. He permeated. He prevailed. He imposed himself. He changed everything. Mr. Ramsey's intellectual and social authority as the head of the Ramsey family gives him an arrogance that squeezes the life out of his social subordinates, his children, his wife, and even Lily Briscoe. So, um, but where Mr. Ramsey stifles Lily's creativity, Mr. Banks respected. And that is 
the difference between these characters that brought Lily closer to Mr. Bank. Even if he doesn't entirely get what she's going for, Mr. Bank's contrast with Mr. Rams is underlined by his own internal monologue in part one. And that is so beautiful. Um, it says, he was anxious for the sake of this friendship with Lily Briscoe. And perhaps too in order to clear himself in his own mind from the imputation of having dried and shrunk for Ramsey lived in a welter of children. Whereas Banks was childless and a widower. He was anxious that Lily Briscoe should not disparage Ramsey, a great man in his own way, yet should understand how things stood between them. And these lines will let you understand the, the kind of relationship that these both of these characters were sharing. What Mr. Banks basically wants from Lily is the recognition that yes, he belongs to Mr. Ramsey's generation. They knew each other as boys, but they have each developed along different tracks. Mr. Ramsey has become a family man as well as a philosopher, but Mr. Banks, who does not occupy the kind of traditional family structure, Mr. Ramsey prizes. He's childless and a widower. Can talk to Lily about her painting without becoming hostile, um, competitive, or patronizing. And this degree of free thinking and liberty reassures Lily that her painting can be meaningful across gender lines. Um, she remembered how William Banks had been shook by her neglect in her painting of the significance of mother and son. Did she not admire their, their beauty, he said. Um, but William, she remembered, had listened to her with his wise child's eyes when she explained how it was not irreverence, thanks to his scientific mind. He understood a proof of this entrusted intelligence which had pleased her and comforted her enormously. One could talk of painting then seriously to a man. Finally, she realized something totally opposite that she would feel when she's talking to Mr. Charles Tansley. Banks cares about the significance of mother and son, both as real people such as James and Mrs. Ramsey, but also as social categories of relationships. Still, he's capable of overcoming his own prejudices to admire Lily's work according to her own reasoning. They can have a conversation about painting that would be impossible between Lily and Mr. Ramsey with the latter's real um, caveman views on women. As far as cavemen go though, Charles Tensley is pretty far up there. And here starts the difference between these two categories of men. He's the one who comes right out and says repeatedly that women can't paint and can't write. They can't produce. They can't create. The thing about Charles is that he is joking for position in a social world that he feels should be controlled by men and specifically by intellectual philosophical men like Mr. Ramsey and of course himself. He doesn't feel that he should be forced to compete with Lily Briscoe in conversation. And he gets all frustrated during the dinner party when she doesn't play along with him at first. The thing that prevents Lily from being oppressed by Tansley is that she has her work to fall back on. She says, she had done the, the usual trick. Be nice. Lily would never know Charles Tansley. He would never know her. Human relations were all like that. She thought, and the worst, if it had not been for Mr. Banks, were between men and women. And she remembered that next morning, she would move the tree further towards the middle. And her spirits rose so high at the thought of painting tomorrow that she laughed out loud at what Mr. Tansley was saying. Let him talk all night if he liked it. That's what that's how she would take this criticism. Lily's feeling embarrassed because she's done the usual trick. Tensley is being a total jerk at this party. But even so, Lily falls back onto her social training 
as the women of the 1920s and smooths everything over. She submits to him socially so that he'll stop hating life, even though he's been a creep to Lily and everyone else around him. But then Lily recalls that she has something of her own to fall back, um, fall back on that painting with a tree that she'll be moving further towards the middle. Uh, and even though she has to deal with the social hierarchy on a daily basis, it's a huge relief to the painter, Lily, that she also has this private, emotionally meaningful place to speak her own mind, to have her own catharsis, an outlet where she can breathe openly. So Lily doesn't care what Tensley is narrating on about at the dinner table. He has no power over her because she is not allowing him to do so. Lily's work and Mr. Banks are the two things that convince her that social relations between men and women aren't hopeless. There are decent men out there and even when Lily happens not to be seated next to one of them, at the dinner table, she's carved out an intellectual identity for herself then that can protect her. So, um, first comes love, then comes marriage is a philosophy um, that Lily offers. Let's see how she uh, portrays her opinion about this. We have talked a little bit about Lily's difficult relationship with men. So it should come as no surprise that she doesn't want to get married, although she wants to be loved. She seems to view marriage and personal creativity as incompatible, and she gives us plenty of evidence for this. You must be, this will make you remember uh, the very interesting uh, conversation between Lily and Mrs. Ramsey when Lily was in, in her bedroom, and she asked Mrs. Ramsey if she's, uh, she's one person after all this year or she has become half of a person. Far at any rate, Lily said to herself, she not, need not marry. Thank heaven, she need not undergo that degradation. She was saved from that dilution. She would move the tree rather more to the middle. She has liberty. She thinks that being married is serving men and obeying them all the time. Here's where Lily comes up against the character of Mrs. Ramsey, who has her own form of creativity even in this position. Mrs. Ramsey is a social artist. She puts together dinner parties and holds together her family. She adopts strays like Lily Briscoe and William Banks, bringing them into the sunny circle of the Ramsey family. But Mrs. Ramsey is limited by her inability to imagine an identity outside of traditional society. And Lily Briscoe doesn't have that restriction. She makes a place for herself to express her own feelings and private understanding of what is going on around her and the way she looks at it. The space is her own, very own private space. That is her canvas to paint to paint her own thoughts. So what's interesting about Lily's painting besides the fact that it's a non-representational and abstract kind of like to the lighthouse is that Lily knows that perhaps no one will ever see it. It is going to be silent. It is going to be hidden. Her work gave her something to talk about with Mr. Banks, but otherwise it has no communicative function. Lily's basically resigned herself to the fact that her painting is going to wind up in someone's attic. But isn't, but isn't art supposed to help you express yourself? How can it be meaningful if it's not public? These are the questions that you need to think about. What Wolf is fighting against here is the notion that the only way that art is meaningful is if its creator is famous. And if he or she is not, then it won't become meaningful. But not, isn't it that at the same time, art is an outlet. It gives you a space of catharsis. During the time in which this novel is set, fame favors men. If you want to get more on this theme, 
the masculine and feminism, you will definitely uh, get so many of the writers and critics who are um, discussing the literature from 20th century in the light of feministic approach. After all, Mr. Ramsey is famous and he uses his established reputation as an intellectual as another way of oppressing the people around him. Think of all that out of context poetry he spouts to the embarrassment of Mrs. Ramsey and you will get to see um, how this uh, phenomenon was uh, cherished in that time. Lily on the other hand can use on the same questions that face Mr. Ramsey, the meaning of life without pushing anybody else down. What's more, painting helps her gain perspective, a view of her own. Lily's thoughts about life and the universe aren't in the abstract logical terms that Mr. Ramsey uses. Lily paints the Ramsey's and the lighthouse in an attempt to make sense of her own lived experience, the things that she could understand. Lily finds significance in fleeting scenes of daily life around her a project that certainly resembles Say Wolf's own Mrs. Dalloway painting for Lily is a means for personal revelation to project her own feelings. And this was all about Lily's character. James is another significant character in the story and most of the time you will find her asking a question and asking the same question again and again repeatedly. And this question has a significance. What's, what significance this question can have is one question that you need to think about. And um, before that you start thinking about this question, one needs to be very clear about uh, James Ramsey's character and how James' character is supporting the plot of the novel. He is basically the youngest of the Ramsey's family of eight children. He starts out the novel as a six year old and finishes it when he is 16 and as finishes as a mel melancholy sullen 16 year old boy. The things that he would hate in the beginning in his father are all the things that he has in himself by the end of the story. James in, in entire character revolves around his desire to go to the, to the lighthouse. In part one, he desperately wants to go but will not be allowed by his father, although all the time his mother is supporting him in his wish. However, in the part three, his father makes him to sail there most against his will in the memory of his late wife. Now, that sharp contrast will help you understand three things in the story. Um, James' character. James, uh, Mr. Ramsey's attitude towards his family and James and his mother's relationship as well. James' obsession makes it obvious that this lighthouse isn't just a lighthouse. It, it's in the title, so it's got to have huge symbolic significance. Wanting to go to the lighthouse and then refusing to go to the lighthouse becomes one tool, one technique and strategy to show the reader James' shifting of attitude, James' shift of thought, difficult relationship between characters and between categories of relationships like father and son, like son and mother, like husband and wife like James and the universe, in a child's innocence and, and the hampering um, and the hedging situations that a child faces in the universe outside. All right, so James is caught between his profound bond with his mother and his fiercely competitive relationship with his father, who he finds all the time standing um, in competition with him to win his mother's love. Even at six, he, he's filled with apparent loathing for Mr. Ramsey and the place that he occupies in Mrs. Ramsey's family. And James' fixation on Mrs. Ramsey is by no means one-sided. Mrs. Ramsey wishes that James and his sister Cam would never grow up. 
she should have liked to keep forever just as they were, demons of wickedness, angels of delight, never to see them grow up into long-legged monsters. Mrs. Ramsey, as mother of eight, derives much of her identity from being a mother, with a capital M. Her intense relationship with James, and to a lesser extent Cam, keeps that maternal identity alive. Of course, the problem with maintaining Mrs. Ramsey as the ultimate mother is that James doesn't just want to be her son. He kind of wants to be his dad. Fantasizes about plunging um, a knife into Mr. Ramsey's heart. And because we have no evidence that James is actually a psychopath, we have to figure that this is symbolic of a more general desire to replace his dad. To prevent his father from interrupting James' special tie to Mrs. Mrs. Ramsey. And Mrs. Ramsey is in a subtle way um, complicit in this competition between these two men in her life. Perhaps you will wake up and find the sun shining and the birds singing, Mrs. Ramsey is saying, said compassionately, soothing the little boy's hair for her husband with his caustic saying that it would not be fine had dashed her spirits she could see. This going to the lighthouse was a passion of ja James she saw. So Mrs. Ramsey shows that James in wanting to go to the lighthouse is thirsting after independence from his father's control. Mr. Ramsey's caustic or in other words harsh Refusal is squashing little, jams, uh, little James' spirit all the time. Mrs. Ramsey sees the power struggle going on here and does her best to soften the pain on both sides for Mr. Ramsey as well as James. But in the end, she's as invested as Mr. Ramsey is keeping things as they are. So she's mad at Mr. Ramsey for being mean to James, but she also recognizes the necessity after all. If the weather is bad, they, can, they can't sail to the lighthouse. From Mrs. Ramsey's perspective, it's the natural order of things that Mr. Ramsey should be able to make James knuckle under. After all, he's the father of the household. Anyway, all of this kind of changes in part 3 when Mrs. Ram Ramsey has died and the Ramsey family is returning for the first time in 10 years to, the, to that old setup on this isle of sky. The love triangle is gone. There is no more Mrs. Ramsey for James and Ms. Mr. Ramsey to compete over. So why after all this time does Mr. Ramsey insist that the family sail to the lighthouse? So that's a question that probably you'll be able to answer now after this discussion. Well, he's got a figurative torch to pass to the next generation. He compels James and Cam to accompany him. And in the process, there's a profound shift of power that is handed over to James. Um, anyway, James starts out the trip all. Resist him, fight him, for we must fight tyranny to the death. But the thing about tyranny is that it's all very well to fight it when you are one of the oppressed. It's a lot more seductive when you get to, to be tyrant. And the thing that is perhaps going on is, the, is this final voyage, is that Mr. Ramsey is um, exerting the last of his control over the family to pass on his authority to his children and especially to James, his youngest son. Consider the moment when they finally arrive at the lighthouse and James sees, so it was like that, the lighthouse one had seen across the bay all these years. It was a stark tower on a bare rock. It satisfied him. It confirmed some obscure feeling of his, about his own character and he finally got to see the reality, reality he was wishing for since ever. What James finds in the lighthouse is confirmation of his own character and power, 
of the character that he is inheriting from his father, who also loves the lighthouse. The sudden doubling between James and Mr. Ramsay is underscored at the end of this paragraph, when James reflects, they shared that knowledge. We are driving before a gale. We must sink. We begin saying to himself, half aloud, exactly as his father said it. After all of his sullen resistance, James has been drawn in at, le at last to the p patrical power he's desired since he was six years old. What that knowledge is, we the reader do not know. It is something ineffable shared between James and Mr. Ramsey. Something that can the sister witnesses but can't join in. But you have got it now, Cam thinks. Recognize that James has finally inherited from Mr. Ramsey the praise that he has always wanted. The thing about lighthouse as we talk about in the lighthouse section of symbols, imagery and allegories is that it's a symbol of both preeminence and transcendence. The foundation of the family remains intact, but the man who filled the position of head of the family must change over time. James' final arrival on the lighthouse represents a great shift of power in the Ramses family. James has finally gotten what he wanted all those years. So, um, James finally gets to be his dad. And this makes James the most important male character in the play. And with this, we are now ready to start with the different themes um, in the plot that we need to explore together. And let's see how do they support our understanding of comprehension the story. So, starting with the themes, the first theme that we are going to discuss is the theme of time. Time is not experienced conventionally into the lighthouse because of the narrative technique, stream of consciousness practiced by the writer. But seriously, what is? What is it? What time? What significance time is sharing in this, in this, in this particular story? Instead, time is anchored in certain select moments which completely distorts it from the way a clock experiences time. Time is measured as it is experienced by certain people, which infuses select moments with incredible importance and duration. That is very important. In other parts of the novel, 10 years is covered in about a dozen pages. Time is therefore both elongated and compressed. However, it depends the need the writer is uh, in while writing and depicting the uh, what goes in that time. So what kind of questions can come over the theme of time and how can you cover them? Um, how can you discuss different aspects of theme of time? What is the effect of compressing 10 years into a dozen or so pages? Do you think Virginia Woolf did it successfully? Or could it have been uh, otherwise? 10, page, 10, 12 pages could have been used for other time, this other type of time, and probably the rest of novel could have covered 10 years of time. What are the differences and similarities in how Mrs. Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey, and Lily view and approach time? In a sense, to the lighthouse takes place over the span of 24 hours only. We begin with an afternoon and evening part one, enter into a long night part two, which also happens to be 10 years, and then we end with the events of one morning. What is the effect of this? Could, an, could the author have done it differently? Would have be, there have been any difference if, if, if it were different than these three days that the writer has covered? In some parts of the novel, many pages are lavished on moments that last nanoseconds. In other parts, barely a word is given to the passing of years. What is this technique and what kind of benefit it, it provides to the writer as well as to the readers? 
does this distortion of time accurately reflect how human perceives the world? Is it, is, it, is it real? Does it happen or is it different? If it is different, how it is? And when you are writing your answers to support your um, perceptions and interpretations of writing, you need to bring some reference from the text. I am giving you quite a longer text as quotes. However, you can pick text, the length of text required. However, it shouldn't be all text in your answer. A text, a part of text has to be there to substantiate what you are saying. Um, at one point, you will find, to her son these words conveyed an extraordinary joy, as if it were settled, the expedition were bound to take place, and the wonder to which he had looked forward for years and years, it seemed, was after a night's darkness and a day's sail, without touch, within touch. Since he belonged, even at the age of six, to that great clan which cannot keep this feeling separate from that, but must let further prospects, future prospects, with their joys and sorrows, could what is actually at hand, since to such people, even in earliest childhood, any turn in the wheel of sensation has the power to crystallize and transfix the moment upon which its gloom or radiance rests. James Ramsey, sitting on the floor, cutting out pictures from the illustrated cat catalog of the Army and Navy stories, Navy stores, endowed the picture of a refrigerator as his mother spoke with heavenly bliss. It was fringed with joy. So how beautifully the time is expressed. The, the, the moves of time um, have been expressed. Um, James Ramsey experiences time in extremely relative terms. Great anticipation equals years of waiting, and the future is capable of infusing the present. I guess with human beings it is like that. The associations that we develop with time help us remember that. We do not have that clockwise frame that we follow in our everyday life to remember our past. We associate time with things. Sometimes these are objects, sometimes these are events, sometimes these are other movements. Sometimes um, for each human being it is different. We all have our own associations to uh, link with time and then they stand as a unit of time inside human being. So um, another reference from text will help us uh, understand this um, a little further. When, when Regina says, they both smiled, standing there, they both felt a common hilarity, excited by the moving waves, and then by the, by the, by the swift cutting race of a sailing boat, which, having sliced a curve in the bay, stopped, shivered, let its sail drop down, and then, with a natural instinct to complete the picture, after this swift movement, both of them looked at the, at the duns far away. Duns far away, and instead of merriment, felt come over them some sadness, because the thing was completed, partly and partly, because distant views seemed to outlast by a million years, Lily thought. The gazer and to be communing already with a sky which beholds an earth entirely at rest. Such a beautiful uh, composition of um, waves moving inside the sea and provoking thoughts um, taking their turn in a human brain. And um, Lily and Mr. Banks are over come as they feel the vastness of time as embodied by the distant views. Well, this let us understand now the transcendence of life and work and again it has a close relevance with the theme of time too. 
Uh, Mr. Ramsey and Mrs. Ramsey take completely different approaches to life. They are two different people. They, are, they belong to different schools of thought. He, Mr. Ramsey realizes um, on his intellect. He relies more on his intellect while she, Mrs. Ramsey, depends on her emotions and feelings. But they share the knowledge that the world around them is transient, that nothing lasts forever, and there is end. There is an end and limit to everything. Mr. Ramsey reflects that even the most enduring of reputations, such as Shakespeare's, are doomed to eventual oblivion. So there is no point worrying about it. This realization accounts for the bitter aspect of his character. Frustrated by the inevitable demise of his own body of work and envious of the few geniuses who will outlast him, he plots to found a school of philosophy that argues that the world is designed for the average, unadorned man for the lifetime in the tube rather than for the rare immortal writer. And that's what he wants to be. Well, Mrs. Ramsey is as keenly aware as her husband of the passage of time and of mortality. She recoils, for instance, at the notion of James, and these are the instances, that James growing into an adult and into a man eventually. She registers the world's many dangers and knows that no one, not even her husband, can protect her from them. Her reaction to this knowledge is markedly different from her husband's. Whereas Mr. Ramsey is bowed by the weight of his own demise, Mrs. Ramsey is fueled with the need to make precious and memorable whatever time she has on earth. Such crafted moments, she reflects, offer the only hope of something that endures and lasts. Now, how can art be a mean of preservation? Why is art keeping this significance in 20th century and how it is reflected by the writer? In the face of an existence that is inherently without order or meaning, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey employ different strategies for making their lives significant and memorable. Mr. Ramsey devotes himself to his progression through the course of human thought, while Mrs. Ramsey cultivates memorable experiences from social interactions. Neither of these strategies, however, proves an adequate means of preserving one's experience. After all, Mr. Ramsey fails to obtain the philosophical understanding he so desperately desires, and Mrs. Ramsey's life, though filled with moments that have the shine and resilience of Ruby's ends. Only Lily Briscoe finds a way to preserve her experience, and that way is through her art. So the only medium of preservance is perceived as art that was given to Lily Briscoe as her tool in the character. As Lily begins her portrait of Mrs. Ramsey at the beginning of the novel, Wolf notes the scope of the project. Lily needs to order and, can, and connect elements that have no necessary relation in the world. However, they can mold them down, can modify them the way she perceives on her own very private place, the canvas. Hedges and houses and mothers and children. By the end of the novel, ten years later, Lily finishes the painting she started, which stands as a moment of clarity, wrested from confusion. Art is, perhaps, the only hope of surety in a world destined and determined to change. For while mourning Mrs. Ramsay's death and painting on the lawn, Lily reflects that nothing says all changes, but not words, not pains. It's nothing that stays forever, but the, but the memories captured in, in the shape of words and paintings. And that is the significance of art projected um, so widely um, in the 20th century. The subjective nature of reality. What is reality? Is there one reality, the reality, or there are many realities? 
Towards the end of the novel, Lily reflects that in order to see Mrs. Ramsey clearly, to understand her character completely, she would need at least 50 pairs of eyes. Only then would she be privy to every possible angle and nuance. The truth, according to this assertion, rests in the accumulation of different, even opposing vantage points. Wolf's technique in structuring the story mirrors Lily's assertion. She is committed to creating a sense of the world that not only depends upon the private perceptions of her character, but is also nothing more than the accumulation of those perceptions. To try to remain to reimage the story as told from a single character's perspective in the tradition of the Victorian novelist, from the author's perspective, is it is to realize the radical scope and difficulty of Wolf's project. Uh, the restorative effect of beauty. What is beauty? How is beauty um, seen and captured uh, in Virginia's work? At the beginning of the novel, you will find that both Mr. Ramsey and Lily Briscoe are drawn out of moments of irritation by an image of extreme beauty. The image in both cases is a vision of Mrs. Ramsay's who she sits reading with James is a sight powerful enough to incite rapture in William Banks. Beauty retains this soothing effect throughout the novel. Something as trifling as a large but very beautiful arrangement of fruit cane. For a moment, um, assuage the discomfort of the guest at Mrs. Ramsay's dinner party. Lily later complicated the notion of beauty as restorative by suggesting that beauty has the unfortunate consequence of simplifying the truth. That is a little complicated philosophy. Her impression of Mrs. Ramsay, she believes, is comprised by a determination to view her as beautiful and to smooth over her complexities and faults. Nevertheless, Lily continues on her quest to still or freeze a moment from life and make it beautiful. Although the vision of an isolated moment is necessarily incomplete, it is lasting and, as such, endlessly seductive to her. Well, there is also theme of memory and the past and this theme again has um, close connection with theme of time and preservance. Because time is such a distorted thing into the lighthouse, memory and the past are a vital part of the character's present. When a single moment is given the, the tenth degree, every significant aspect of the moment is interrogated. Well, it's also important to note that a lot of important information is transferred via character's memories, which makes sense since in real time the novel only truly covers one day and the rest of the novel is all memory and past. So what kind of questions can come up when you are being inquired about the significance of memory in the plot? In part one, Mrs. Ramsey makes a number of predictions regarding what events or occurrences various people will remember. Using part three as your guide, to what extent were Mrs. Ramsey's predictions accurate? Lily's attitude towards the time she spent at the Ramsey's summer house ten years ago alternates between sadness and relief. Weigh her emotions. What is the net outcome? Is she nostalgic for that time or happy to be free of it? Well, how and where does the memory of Mrs. Ramsay come up in part 3? Is it weird that Lily seems to think of Mrs. Ramsay the most often? Well, and um, I want you to think about these questions when you are listening to these different themes and try to recall your interpretation and understanding. Definitely there are questions, critical questions that, will be, that I'll be discussing with you in the end. And then out of those questions and discussions, you definitely will be getting cues to answer your questions that are now, um, you know, um, rising in your head. Theme of love. Well, 
Love takes several different forms in the, in the text of this novel. Lasting love that's still flawed. Love that casts a glow on everyone else. Love that doesn't last. Friendly love, familiar love, admiring love, love as an intellectual topic, etc. But the main point is that love is not the sort of all-consuming force you see in Anna Karenina. Love in To the Lighthouse is pretty tame and usually turns out to be love for Mrs. Ramsey most of the time. So what kind of questions can be asked regarding the theme of love? Why does everyone keep fa falling in love with Mrs. Ramsey? Why is Mrs. Ramsey's character is of that importance? And that you will find what, where I discuss Mrs. Ramsey's character and different angles of her character that will enable her to see different aspects of, the, of her personality. Why does not? Or who loves her with a grain of salt? With who would have the kind of, um, uh, you see, a mixture of feeling towards her? Um, not absolute love, not absolute hatred, rather a combination of these emotions. Um, some ambivalence of attitude. Much is made of Paul and Minta on the night of their engagement. They are so in love. Why didn't this last then? Why did they get separate? Why did they get separated in, uh, after a while? while? What do they lack that Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey do not? And how could uh, despite having so different characters right from the beginning, how could, they, how could this relation last till the end of Mrs. Ramsey's life? According to Lily, love takes a, th a thousand shapes. What are the various shapes it takes into the lighthouse? You, here you need to identify the types of love you can see, as I quickly, precisely named them in the previous slide. Do Mr. and Mrs. Mr. And Mrs. Ramsey love each other at all? If they do, how will you support this answer? So with the, with the theme of love, there comes in theme of gender. Well, it's a Wolf's novel, so gender figures in all the uh, chauvinistic remarks that the men make and the protective tone towards men that Mrs. Ramsey takes. Also, Mrs. Ramsey is held up as an ideal of womanhood. Lily Briscoe deviates from this ideal because she's not interested in marriage or comforting and sympathizing with every male character in the novel. Uh, which men into the lighthouse have the most positive view of women? Which men have the most negative view? That is a question to be answered. Is Mrs. Ramsey ultimately a triumphant figure of femininity or a, or a downtrodden and delusional one? Is Cam more of a traditional Mrs. Ramsey like women or a rebellious Lily like women? What's up with the whole women being fertile and men being barren thing? Well, that's an important question about gender. These are different gender-related issues that Virginia Woolf um, raised in her writing. And, 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 and a linking theme with love, gender is marriage. Mrs. Ramsey really wants everyone to get married, particularly women. She, she doesn't think of women um, unmarried. She herself is in a marriage that at least one character holds up as an ideal. Interestingly enough, her marriage to Mr. Ramsey is actually the only real marriage we see in the novel. We do, however, hear about, by Lily's memory, how the really marriage which Mrs. Ramsey had encouraged so much worked out it was unsuccessful. Who wears the pants in the Ramses marriage? What makes for a successful marriage in the world of To the Lighthouse? Why did Mrs. Ramsey have such a hard time telling her husband about the greenhouse bill? Why does Mrs. Ramsey read to James, the fisherman and his wife? Mrs. Ramsey can get people to marry because she has excellent powers of manipulation. She can make an any man feel like the strongest, most man, mainly man ever. Aside from um, a theme of manipulation is a theme that you will find basically a sub-theme of all the themes. Theme of manipulation is an, is, is an action in, in all the themes. And aside from this manipulation, Mrs. Ramsey is very well attuned to people's desire 
and needs, which comes in handy because her husband can be rather demanding when it comes to ego stroking. So, what kind of questions can come up regarding this theme of manipulation? What role does Mrs. Ramsey's beauty play in her ability to manipulate? Do Mrs. Ramsey's manipulation skill help make her marriage more successful or less successful? To what extent is Mrs. Ramsey aware of her own ability to manipulate? To what extent are Mrs. Doyle's charges against Mrs. Ramsey's accurate? And here comes the theme of admiration, a very important theme that is supporting other themes in the story as well. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey are both well admired in their respective fields and characters. Mr. Ramsey tends to be followed around by young philosopher students who admire his work and although Mrs. Ramsey shuns admiration, most people admire her beauty and grace. And in a way, they both are running after this admiration to an extent. So, the questions can be, does Mr. Tansley ever deviate from his admiration of Mr. Ramsey? And there you can count this, the scene from the movie that you are going to watch shortly um, after one or two lectures uh, where they have a conversation between, there is a conversation between Tansley and Mrs. Mr. Ramsey where Tansley shouts at him for him being um, ignorant of his efforts. Does Mrs. Ramsey admire Lily? Why does Lily admire Mrs. Ramsey and yet consciously go against Mrs. Ramsey's wishes? Why does William Banks admire Mrs. Ramsey so much and admires Lily at the same time? We know that both of these women are entirely different characters. And then theme of identity. Mrs. Ramsey in particular is very conscious of her identity, constantly interrogating herself and her character. She adopts a very sub subordinate position when in her interactions with other people, which means that her own true self is frequently stifled. But good news, when there are no people around to ponder to, her own private self has room to explore. Lily also contemplates her identity often. What the deal with the wedge-shaped core of darkness? Check out the um, the relationship between the Lily and the men in the story. What are the basis of those conclusions, those masculine gender oriented decisions that are made in the story? Is Mrs. Ramsey derive and desire to con continuously um, lavish attention on others merely a mechanism to downplay herself or there is some other wish involved? Or is it a kind of rebel against male chauvinistic society? And with after the theme of love, gender, manipulation, marriage, there comes theme of victory, winning and losing. Victory into the lighthouse most frequently occurs over life, but occasionally victory is scored over other people as well. The main point, however, is that victory occurs beneath the surface into the lighthouse and often in social interactions. Mrs. Ramsey scores a victory by not saying that she is in love with her husband. Yet Mr. Ramsey has never asked her to say it and, she wins, and he wins in his desire too. On the surface they have a perfectly civilized conversation. Victory and defeat occur in the nuances of interaction, not in the overt way that say a world war encompasses victory and defeat. So these points of victory and defeats, they become a part of everyday conversation and routine. And in, in, in each conduct, human beings tend to defeat their, um, their encounters with other human beings, whether it's by word, by gesture, by action, or any other way of um, conveying the message. The question can be that how exactly does one triumph over life? How do the characters in the novel do it? Do they win their life um, in comparison with the plans of life itself? What's up with Lily's triumph over the dead Mrs. Ramsey? Do you think she's a winner or do you think she's a loser? What's the deal with the personal victories over other characters? and these helpful or destructive in personal relationships, especially 
um, think of that, that conversation on dinner table when Tansley is being um, highly mocked by the, the, the family members and Lily does not come forward to help him. James and Lily are the two most victorious characters at the end of the novel. Evaluate the previous statement. Theme of friendship. After the theme of love, the most cherished theme is theme of friendship in Virginia's work. Friendship plays a secondary role to love in the novel, but for Lily Briscoe, friendship is the most she has ever truly wanted from her opposite sex. The other friendship we see uh, retrospectively is between Mr. Ramsey and Mr. Bank, though it failed. So the questions can be that, why are Lily and William friends only? Why couldn't they marry each other? Could Mrs. Ramsey have persuaded them to become more than that? Or there was a kind of subtle uh, hesitation on the part of these characters that made them apart and, then, and yet so close. What is William Banker's attitude towards friendship? What is the role of friendship in this novel as a matter of fact? And then theme of laws and orders and principles and rules and regulation. Mrs. Rems is extremely attuned to harmony and disorder and she also takes on the task of creating as much harmony as possible. This is a double-edged sword because she frequently sacrifices truth in order to preserve harmony. She adheres to a certain ideal of the world in which everyone is united and, and everything is at peace. The question can be that to what extent is Mrs. Ramsey's preference for harmony positive? Especially when you find uh, her disliked by her own daughter uh, at points when she's defending Mr. Ramsey for something and at the same point uh, we know that she is not really agreeing with his uh, point of view. What causes division among the house guests in the first place? Uh, what kind of disputes you can identify in the very beginning? How do Mr. Tensley and Mr. Carmichael play into the harmony versus disorder schema? So this was all about today's talk and we discussed themes in detail. I wanted to include motives and symbols as well, but that was uh, lengthening the talk and uh, I hope that I'll be able to cover them in the coming lecture, inshallah. So what we did today, basically we analyzed the characters in detail, the major characters that, that basically shaped the story. And in that we discussed Lily's character. Um, Lily as a representative of, a representative, representative of feminine um, f philosophy of Virginia Woolf and James Ramsey's character again a very important and significant male representation in the play and we discussed